Taylor Twellman was raised in St. Louis, Missouri and attended St. Louis University High School where he was an all-star athlete in American football, basketball, soccer, and baseball. Upon graduation in 1998, he rejected a contract by the Kansas City Royals, electing to play soccer at the University of Maryland instead. In 2000, he signed with Bundesliga side 1860 Munich, played two seasons on the reserve side, notched 29 goals and 58 appearances. In 2002, Twelman returned to the U.S. to play with the New England Revolution. In his first MLS season, Twelman tied for Golden Boot honors with Carlos Ruiz. In 2005, he won both the MLS MVP and Golden Boot, finishing the regular season with 17 goals. In 2007, MLS rejected a reported $1.2 million bid from Norwegian side Odd Grenland. In 2008, MLS rejected another bid for the player, this time totaling $2.5 million from legacy championship side Preston North End. Twelman missed the majority of the 2008 and 2009 MLS seasons after suffering a neck injury and a subsequent serious concussion in the game against the Los Angeles Galaxy. After struggling to find playing time for three subsequent seasons due to that injury, he finally announced his retirement from the game at the end of 2010. Sports and soccer run deep in the Twelman clan. Taylor's father, Tim, and uncles Mike and Steve all played in NASL.1. His brother, Jim, broke in with the San Jose Earthquakes Reserves in 2002. His grandfather, Jim Delsing, was a Major League Baseball outfield in the 50s. And his uncle is a pro golfer. Taylor Twelman, honored to have him on the show. How you doing, Taylor? Good. I think I'm more honored to be with Soccer Re- Reform. Are you kidding me? Oh, please. <laughs> How are you, Ted? How are you? Good. How are you doing, Taylor? Good. This uh, this has been a long time coming, and I'm actually really looking forward to it. So let's get right into it. Well, awesome. Let's before we do anything, y- you and Aleko and some other folks have done some great work on the brain injury stuff, uh, vis-a-vis soccer and vis-a-vis sports in general. How can people help? How's it going? If you've got a little two second spiel you want to go into, and then we can just jump into some other fun stuff from there. It's it, it, it's interesting, Ted, because you know a lot of times you look at things like my traumatic brain injury and there are a lot of dark days in my past and and some currently and you look at it and what can you do and there were days where I just wanted to sit in that dark room and try to feel better and actually I realized that the only way to feel better is by helping others and I'm not necessarily 100% concerned with just a professional athlete I'm more concerned about the youth and, and the amateur athlete that doesn't have the resources that we do as pro athletes. And that's why I started a foundation, thinktaylor.org. And it's funny, Ted, because it's not really funny, but it kind of is because I started a foundation and started talking about traumatic brain injuries. I lost six and a half thousand followers on Twitter. (laughs) So here I am thinking I can do better and do good. And yet sometimes I think people are just tired of hearing about it, but it's my mission. And some days I wonder why I'm on this earth and why me, but I, I think I know why because I, I, I want to help out people. It's it, to me, I, I that's just bizarre that you would lose followers over something like that. I mean, I, and I get a little upset when sometimes when I talk about this brain injury stuff, people say, "Well, uh, you know, generally it comes up when you talk about the NFL and league of denial and all that kind of stuff." And then people jump in and say, "Well, look, these soccer players are all doing these headers and." And, you know, they're getting brain injuries, too. And I say, no, that, you know, soccer doesn't have the history of of brain injuries that NFL does. But, uh, you know, guys like Taylor Twellman and and Aleko and some others out there have certainly had problems with that. And it's significant and it's real. And and it's I think it's important that everybody pays attention to it, be it soccer or NFL or, or whatever sport or whatever activity it's happening in. Exactly. That's a good, it's a great point. I mean, Ted, the reality is you could fall out of your chair right now while we're doing this podcast and this conversation and you can get a concussion. I, I compare it and the Republican senator from California did a very good job five years ago in front of Congress. It's no different than smoking, right? right? We have to be more educated. And people have to understand the problems with smoking. It's the same thing with traumatic injuries in sports. And we have to be aware. You're still, sports aren't going to go anywhere. But to say to our 9-year-old daughters and our 10-year-old sons, no, head this moving object at a you know, 50, 60 miles an hour, it's okay. I think we need to maybe rethink things a little bit and still continue to grow the sport. I personally believe there's a byproduct. You become fundamentally a better soccer player at a younger age if we don't concentrate primarily on heading. But it, it's just it, it's the education and awareness, Ted, that's 100% what I'm behind. And so people are making more educated decisions than we have in the past. 
I, I hope you gain followers doing that from here on in, and I hope that uh, I hope that the, the the issue gets more attention because it certainly deserves it. Let's move into uh, the the fun topic of the day, and it was kind of an interesting day because you, I, I've been watching this for a while, and and I think it's 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 fair to say that what happened on ESPN FC today was was a little bit. Um, groundbreaking in terms of the promotion relegation just coming out. And I don't know if Steve Nichol meant to say it, and I've seen a lot of chatter on, on how it was meant and what he, what he was thinking and what you guys were thinking about it. But I thought it was awesome that it came up. I thought it was interesting how it came up. Can you tell us more about the conversation that you had that led up to that? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, Ted, I will always have a conversation about promotion relegation with anyone. Um, but on live television, when you only have five to seven minutes, Sometimes the topic can be too in-depth to really get into. I think this is 1A because I think you need a a four-and-a-half to five-hour show to really address promotion relegation. And Steve Nichol, who is a dear friend of mine, we have great conversations. We've had great disagreements as coaching, as he was my head coach and I was a player and now as a colleague – what happened today and, the, and previously, the day before, Stevie and I disagree about expansion being good in MLS, and, I, and I'll get into that in a minute, but he said promotion relegation, and so many people thought he meant that's what is needed, and I asked Stevie, I said, a lot of people on Twitter say, you want promotion relegation, and he right away said, no, 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 no that's not what I said. I said that expansion in other leagues, blah, 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 blah. Ted, you know, you can go through it. It's actually on YouTube. Um, it, the hit's on there. But what Stevie just wanted to clarify today, and honestly, no one from MLS called them. I know you guys <laughs> think there's this conspiracy theory. And I find it funny. I don't take it personal because it is kind of funny. But uh, th- none of that happened. Stevie just looked at me and said, I don't, I don't think MLS needs promotion relegation. And what he's learning, too, is what, where do you change it? I mean, it's discussion, Ted, of chicken before the egg. What happens? Expansion, single entity, promotion, relegation. What comes first? Quality TV ratings. There's so many discussion points that can be had right now. And, uh, you know, Stevie just doesn't believe that the quality of product on the field is being helped by expansion. I actually 100% agree with him, but he believes that six years ago, MLS was better. And I'm sorry, I can't agree with that because I think MLS is better with Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, Montreal, and Philadelphia. I believe it's a better product to sell to TV markets. I think it's a better base, better product. Now, I'm not sure 24 teams is the right answer, Ted. I don't know that yet and we can talk about that but that's kind of the basis of the discussion and actually in the green room we were talking about it and stevie and myself were like dude let's do this on the show this is a good point let's bring it up and that's what happened well good i mean it's and it's good to know that nobody called in and nobody and nobody suggested you guys watch out and i think it's a it's a it's a great conversation i mean say what you want about the conversation i think it's proven to have legs and it's proven to draw attention to the sport whatever whatever side you fall on oh no doubt about i mean it. It, you know it's a it, it's going to drive a lot of passion there's a lot of opinions out there and and a lot of people want to have their say and it seems like no matter what happens and no matter which way mls wants to go this is a great conversation to have there is no denying it that it actually moves the meter on twitter It moves the meter on YouTube, our video clips. Ted, you're 100% correct, and it's a great discussion. But I don't think we can get to that discussion until we have a couple other things in place. And I think we forget a little bit that for 12 to 14 years, this league was in complete debt, Ted. And I think people kind of forget that. So it's hard for me to say to Phil Anschutz, Robert Kraft, and and the Hunts, Listen, we need to go to promotion relegation. By the way, thanks for that fifty to sixty million you put in debt. You know no, what I'm I saying? You. That's why I I'm... hear you. I, I would only go say ahead. one thing out of that, and that is my position isn't that we can tell MLS what to do on promotion relegation. And I think U.S. Soccer has to has to make a move to sanction the system, and then MLS has some decisions to make, and we can do it in, 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 in a, with a transition that gives MLS a time to decide, and maybe. 
you know, the way I talk about doing it is starting in the lower divisions, bringing it up with a date certain, and, and then giving MLS some time to get accustomed to it. And we can probably carve them out a spot to be a closed league outside of the pyramid without that D1 status. Without, And I'm not sure that that changes the argument that much in terms of, in terms of whether we should do it or not. But I think putting MLS in a position to, to, to make the call on this is... I, I don't think any business that, that's built like MLS is ever going to want promotion and relegation. And so uh, for me, it just becomes we have to give them a choice and, and, and maybe choosing not to be in the system and choosing to be maybe a, a league alongside of an open pyramid, if they think that that's a marketable position, that, that could be fine. Well, I think in theory, Ted, it's, it's, I, I mean, it's exactly what ultimately all of our soccer, all of us as soccer purists want, don't we? I mean, in theory, everything you talk about is exactly what we right. want. It's the transition. That's exactly what all right. of us want. We want promotion relegation. We want an open pyramid. Of course. Of course. That would be unbelievable if we had that in the United States. The only argument I will say this is, and I'm an all-sports guy, which is kind of to a fault sometimes for people on Twitter, but no other country in the world has to deal with four legit leagues that are best in the world. You see what I'm I, – so I don't know – if having Charleston Charleston Battery in an open pyramid, you really think that's going to move the needle? I think it definitely moves the needle in Charleston, but uh, but on that market thing, this is one of those arguments that 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 it's very it's very typical and it's and it's worth having for sure. I think that that the U.S. is so different. We are we are such a huge market that yes, we have four big sports league, we have college football, we have a hundred different sports. But we are a hundred times bigger market than than some of the European nations. I think we are distinct and special enough to have promotion and relegation alongside a system and alongside four really strong sports that already exist. Yeah, Ted, let me ask you a question. How many in your open pyramid, how many teams would you think we need? Would it be two divisions or three divisions in your eyes? Uh, I think it can be expanded to as, as deep as we want to expand it. I mean, just I, I don't I don't think there should be a bottom cap. I guess my question is how many how many teams or owners would you have in your open pyramid? I'm just curious. I'm uh, curious. I would have the way I do it is split actually the U.S. into two pyramids, okay. east and west, because because we're such a big market. And then I set the two 18 team D ones with 18 team D twos and, and then perhaps regionalizing down from there in terms of, uh, you know, maybe you could go down to the state level at the lower, at the lower, at the lower levels. So making it for me, the more open it is, the better. Yes. The more open, but how many teams is that? Because to me, so I right don't there, that's 18, 18, 36. Yep. So that's uh you're pushing, you're pushing what 72 teams in the top two divisions. I don't think that's crazy. I mean, I think MLS, people talk about MLS in terms of 30-plus teams already. And, and, I think, I think and you know what? Can... And I think that's nuts. <laughs> I think you want my – I mean, I've said this. I think 24 teams is pushing the envelope in MLS. I really believe that. In one league, I think it's true. But the U.S. is as large a market as Europe put together. If there's an, an American exceptionalism I believe in, it's the exceptionalism of the American market. So limiting the United States to, to 20 teams, as you might do in England, I think that's kind of crazy since England is what? The size of Illinois market-wise? No, yeah. No, see, I was kind of, yes, I was going to go along with you. I think 72 teams is, that, I think it's nuts, but I think 20 teams in MLS. And then if you can build the strength of a second division, then I actually think you have a, you have a good discussion. I think you have a legit discussion. If you're looking at 72 teams, Ted, I don't think anyone in television is going to televise those games. I don't think owners are really going to make the money, and that's all this is about. I don't care if the owner's in the NASL, USL2, or MLS, single entity or not. It's about the owner making money. Right. And I'm not positive that 72 teams in this country in a sport that's competing to get in the top five is going to make money. Now, if you want to talk... 20 teams in MLS, and then 12 to 14 teams in the USL, NASL that comes together, and you maybe look at two divisions, Ted, then I think you've got a valid argument at some point here. See, the I tough part about do. that, the, the tough part about that, Taylor, and I don't mean to talk over you on this one, but it's if you, if you only have 20 teams in the United States and you really open up the pyramid, it's, I, if I can see a scenario where, where L.A., Seattle, and San Francisco, Northern California can have 10 top-flight teams, 
and the I-95 corridor, which I think you're driving on right now, could have another 10. So right there, you could soak up, it, without, without some serious regulation, you're gonna, you could soak up the entire pyramid, the entire top of the pyramid with, with just the I-95 corridor on the West Coast. Ted, I'm, Ted wait, it, it's almost impossible to get 15,000 fans at the Revs game. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to tell me right now we're going to get 15,000 fans at Bristol, Hey, but back in the 1920s, there were, there were upwards of four or five top-flight clubs in New England, not just one. Dad, I, was, Dad, I wasn't even bored yet. <laughs> I can't talk about that. <laughs> I mean, I listen, this is... This is obviously a great discussion, and I think it's got to be had at some point, and I think it's actually it, it's ha- it's coming about. I actually tweeted today that I think owners are fighting single entity as we speak. Now, it's behind closed doors. It's never going to be public, but I think, fa- I think owners are now seeing, listen, no, we want to kind of loosen the reins a little bit. We want to go spend money. We want to do this, the ones that move the needle, but I think... Right now, because of the bottom part of the last knot, I, I think it's still down the road. I, I, you won't get me to believe that 72 teams can work in, in the United States, Ted, but I will say this. If you tell me it's 36 total and it's 20 and 16, and maybe you go to 40 teams and it's two divisions with relegation, then I think that's something that could be viewed at down the road. Now, if you put a gun to my head right now, Ted, and said, Taylor, do you think promotion and relegation will happen in MLS? I, I just don't see it happening. Right. And partly because the majority of the ownership is NFL and other businessmen that see what happens with the other parity and other leagues, and they're primarily American. And I don't think, for me, it's not a bad thing, but for those of you out there, including yourself, that are very open, you know, spoken about it, and you talk about it a lot, my question to you, Ted, is this, is if there's no single entity and the salary cap is six and a half, seven million, and you're competing with Liga MX for those type of quality players coming over, is MLS still good enough? For, is, is MLS not good enough for you still? Even if you go up to a seven million salary cap, you're still at a fraction of, of, of the EPL average, average team payroll. So... And I mean, right yeah, now it's so, at right. now, now it's it's at one fortieth. So in essence, no. I mean, for me, for me, Taylor, what I want is you a U.S. club to rise and be able to go as far as any club in the world. I want to see international competition where the U where a U.S. club oh, so isn't, isn't prohibited so from I, getting Ted. there. So and and I can't and the salary cap for me is a complete is antithetical to that to that narrative. I can't see how it works. Right, but Ted, I also can't see how MLS is ever going to compete with the rest of the world when they've got a hundred-year history ahead of us. Oh, but we have a hundred-year history too. There are some clubs out there in we, the U.S. that have a hundred-year history. We do. No, Ted, I I played against the, a couple of those clubs in St. Louis. Of course, I know that history of the United States. You're 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 missing what I'm getting at. We don't have a league that's been around for a hundred years that's had. Promotion relegation, that's had what the rest of the world had. So how can you tell me that we need to compete with England, Spain, Germany, and France? Is it a need? I mean, certainly I want. I think that the TV ratings and the interest on the internet show that Americans are, are gravitate towards great clubs. So if we want a league that reaches the American market, we have to give Americans great clubs. I think that's relatively... That's that's pretty straightforward, don't you think? Oh, 100%. But let me ask you, you think there's going to be an American club that ever competes with Manchester United? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, I can bring up the New York Cosmos right now, and, the, and everybody will roll their eyes and say New York Cosmos didn't survive. But the New York Cosmos, on a good, oh, day, on a good day, when they weren't hung no, over... No, no, it's interesting, Ted, because you think about it, you, you bring up the Cosmos, and while I agree with you, on the field product is actually not what I'm talking about. I think I'm talking about the history, the marketability, everything surrounding the Manchester Uniteds, the Real Madrids of the world. Do you think the United States can ever have that? I think that's a real question, don't you? I think in a market the size of the United States, we can have it, but I think the system holds us back. I think we've had it with the Cosmos for a short period of time. I think we had it back in the 1920s with with the Bethlehem Steels and some of those crazy legacy clubs from those days. Well, I don't think you're wrong, actually, Ted, on the, on the product on the field with the Cosmos, but you said it best. I mean, the Cosmos folded. 
So I'm talking about all the off the field stuff, marketability, the history of a club, all of that. That's all I'm saying when I say the United States doesn't have the Manchester United, the Barcelona's, the Real Madrid's of the world, and the Bayern Munich. I remember going to Open Cup games in St. Louis and seeing Kudis play and these clubs that have been around since 1920s. I'm not disregarding that. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying when we talk about top flight soccer in the United States, would you agree with me that we don't have the history of other countries? Right. We don't have the stable history. We don't have the, we don't have the legacy. The clubs don't have the legacy. Although, I mean, if you talk about the Sounders and Timbers and the Cosmos, you are getting 40 years of legacy there, and that, that's nothing to shake a stick at, especially in a system where clubs perpetually fail. I, I can't, you know, for me, that's, that's the point I'll always come back to is it, has soccer failed in this country or has the system consistently failed soccer? And I think that's what we're getting to. That's, that's the crux of this argument. I, don't, I, I am not disrespecting, in St. Louis, I grew up, the Kudis Club, the club that's been around forever. I'm not disrespecting any of that. I'm just saying. Hey, did you, you never played on Kudis, did you? No, I didn't play on Kudis, but I remember going to those games, and I remember one of my uncles played in the NASL, and then he played indoor, and then when he was done, he played in one of those teams. And I remember there was a good, you know, Scott Gallagher's a good club, and they had a couple of those overage players at one time play for Kudis. So I went to those games. And so, Ted, the interesting thing is I'll never disrespect the Open Cup either. I mean, I, I self-deprecate myself because – that was the only big trophy that I could somehow win because I wasn't good enough in MLS Cup, but that's a different story. Oh, All I'm saying to you is when we talk about top flight soccer and the history of clubs like Manchester United, Barcelona, and Real Madrid, it's hard for me to say that the United States is ever going to have that when we haven't had top flight soccer consistently for longer than 20 years. Right, and so you know where I go with that. I'll immediately go and say... To me, there's a systemic problem in which our clubs continue to fail. And the reason our clubs, we can't get that legacy going beyond the 40 years that the, that the Sounders, yep. Timbers, and, and uh, you know, Tampa Bay Rowdies and Cosmos have, which isn't, PSG isn't much older than that, for crying out loud. So you got that going for you. But for me, what I see when I look back at the history of soccer in the United States, I don't see soccer failing. I see the system continuing to fail soccer, and I think MLS is in the same boat. Now, MLS has been given a lot of entitlements, you might say, or some other, some other perks that, that keep, them, keep the financial house in order. But, but MLS is, and if you look at it, especially recently, MLS is, is, is as far from reaching the market potential as, as, as any league in, in U.S. history, and maybe even more so compared to NASL, which didn't have to compete with any of these European leagues. But, but, but I immediately go to this, this system, and I, and I just can't look back over the glory days in the 20s and the resurgences in the 50s and the NASL in the 70s. I, we've got so many of the ingredients of, of a soccer nation, and we've had them for so long. I think it's fair to wonder about the system's role in our perpetual failures. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to sit here and disagree with you. I mean, I think a big part of the reason why Seattle, Vancouver, and Portland work so well is you bring up the point. I mean, their 40-year history, the Timbers, the Sounders, and the Whitecaps. I, I, I had a problem in 1996. I was only 15 at the time. But, Ted, I had a problem with them not going back to the NASL day. I mean, those names. Yeah. I mean, you bring up an interesting point, and it's a simple point of just on the plate, on face value, but don't you find that the Sounders, Timbers, and Whitecaps have just already had that history because they've stayed around instead of coming out and calling them, like, the Seattle Green or whatever you want to call it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I think that's a very interesting topic of discussion. I really believe that, but... I don't know if I can debate having a family that went through the NASL, having moved around to six different teams in, if I'm not mistaken, 10 years, 11 years, and then the league just folds right under my dad's feet, just completely fold. Right. Over expansion, no system in there to help that. So or, you're or talking the system, to someone what about, that, But what about the system itself? I mean, it, it, it's not just you and your dad. I mean, it's, it's, it's you, you know, you can take this all the way back to the 1920s. This same kind of pattern happens where a, 
a closed U.S. league comes up. There's a couple of great teams. They start to shake up the world, and then the league falls apart. It's, it's happened. It's, it, it's, it's one of those tendencies, and it's, a tra- it's been a tragedy the entire way along. So why do you think, it, why do you think the NASL didn't work, Ted? I think the NSL didn't work for the same reasons that every closed top flight soccer league doesn't work. I mean, I think the only way a closed top flight soccer league works, and MLS is still, is, uh, the jury's still out. I mean, MLS is still trying to prove this. But I think the only way it works is in a single entity, and, and that only when teams are, are limited to the point where, you know, you can't really send them out into the international community without feeling kind of sadistic about it because they're operating under such tight strictures compared to the clubs they're meeting in international play. Right, so you're, you're simply saying it's only a soccer issue because you know my rebuttal would be, well, the NFL, Major League Baseball, and the NBA do just fine right. with the salary. Oh, I'm ve- you know I'm really soccer-specific about it. I mean, you can make a great argument for a sport like American football or baseball or, or a local sport or a sport that's or a league that's looked at as dominating the world like NA, NHL or NBA. I mean, to put that in, yep. in that circumstance, I think I think closed leagues are, are, you know, if you can make it work, then God bless you. I don't need to tell you that those teams don't play international matches of any consequence and all that, all that stuff. So, but to me, I think that the coincidence between promotion relegation and and vibrant international play is certainly very consistent. I think there's a real connection there, and I think I think in soccer, oh, I don't. It, it's I important don't think, to have that. It's important. Yeah, I sorry to interrupt you. I don't think you're far off. I don't yeah. think the NASL. My personal opinion is I don't think the NASL failed due to promotion relegation. That's my personal opinion. Um, but for me to say to you that there's no real connection, well, that would be naive as well. Well, I can't I, think, not, I can't think of a top flight league that has failed with promotion and relegation. I mean, the K League and, and Korea and some of those other leagues have backed out of promotion and relegation for a little while and then joined back in. But I can't think, and I, I've dug back through the New York Times for 100 years and I haven't found any example of any league anywhere in the world that's open, that collapses. And again, we can get into the conversation about, you know, American exceptionalism. And cer- certainly things work differently here. But I think that leagues failing is so specific to the way that we do leagues. Yeah, and I think I, I would argue the single entity a little bit stronger than pro- uh, promotion relegation. Yeah. And that's just maybe because I've played in the league. I don't know. Well, but I would entity- argue that single... Go ahead. Single, I think single entity is the one way that we might be able to have a, a top flight soccer league that survives. But, I mean, the question is for me becomes at what cost? And, I mean, from the Forbes article that came out today or yesterday, yep. uh, if I did the math yep. on that, it looks like MLS has pulled in, you know, $34 million profit over in the last year, which is, which is fantastic. But if they can pull in $34 million and give away 80%, 90% of, of U.S. supporters to Europe and Mexico, uh, it seems kind of like that that could perpetuate itself, and maybe there isn't as much incentive to push this thing forward as there might be in an open system. What do you think about that? Um, explain to me your question. I guess, so, because here's, here's what's interesting it, to me. It, Hold on. Before okay, you go okay, into go four, is, I mean, NYCFC is writing a $100 million check. Orlando's going to write sixty to seventy-five million, so there there is money going into MLS, Ted. Right. And I think the new CBA is going to be very interesting as well. Because do the players sit there and then say, "Well, wait a minute, you as a league went and got Clint Dempsey, not Seattle. You're paying him five and a half a year. You told us in the last CBA that Americans weren't worth that type of money. Now you're paying them, and so then you want to tell us the salary cap stays at two point six? That is that's the $20 question. I mean, what happens in that CPA? How far are MLS players willing to push? And, and, and I guess the, kinda... the question for me, though, Taylor, becomes, okay, so, so, so they double the salary cap to, to, to what, 5.6.2? Uh, yeah, just, say, just say for this discussion, let's say $5 million. Just say okay. that. Okay. Five million. And how does that change? I mean, what, how does that change MLS in your mind? I think it's a see, see. Here's what's interesting. I don't think that's the end product. And when I asked you earlier, would you be okay with no single entity and a seven million dollar cap for right now, and you're competing with League MX? I, I believe this has to be 
a systematic process. I don't think we can jump zero to 100. But I also don't think we can shy away from the discussion of what you brought up, promotion relegation, yeah. no single entity, and an open pyramid. I, I'm, I'm okay talking about that. I don't think we're capable in MLS and in the United States to go from zero to 100. So my here, – here, and I hate to reference another sport, but I'm going to. I used to talk to my grandfather – when he was in the 50s in Major League Baseball, and they started the union. And Ted, he used to always say he worked two jobs. He worked in the winter and played ball. They didn't make money. Mm -hmm. But in 2000, in 2006, when he passed away, he was still getting a check from the union for a referral. What I, and he used to always say to me, in those meetings, we didn't worry about today. We worried about tomorrow as players. And so what I'm asking you is, the ne let's say the next CBA, the salary cap does go to $5 million. Is that progress in your eyes? To me, that is. That's progress. That's real progress. It's progress. I, you, can't, you can't say it's not progress. And certainly you can't say that. But is $5 million, I mean, how, it, how no. long did it take to get that, from 2 that, I know where you're going. How long I know did where it take you're going to 2.6 to 5? No, and that's where I... I I completely agree with you. Is two point six to five million that big of a difference? And the reality is, in order to get the starting eleven that you want, the eighteen on the bench, the thirty-two players or twenty-eight players for that matter, no, that's not where you want it. That's not where we want it at all. Of course not. But it is certain type of progress. Oh, there are there are a few I, MLS it, it, coaches. There are a few MLS ahead. coaches I would kill to see what they could do with twenty million, not five. Oh you know? my! Are you kidding me? There are I give a, I like to see some of these coaches with ten million. Uh, Jason Christ with ten million. I mean, uh, Bruce Arena with twenty million. I want to see what happens. Me too. There's no, and I, and I hope I'm alive for it, and I think I will be. But I, I'm with you. I am. Uh, I'm a hundred percent with you. I think this. The coaches and that kind of thing, it's an interesting topic. Ted, you got some good Twitter followers. I'm sure they've got some questions. Do you want to move there or do you want to keep going? Uh, sure, let's move to a couple of Twitter questions. Um, this is from Ultra Brian. My, my market is San Antonio. My interest is in, lo in my local team. No personal vested interest in MLS. No pro rel makes no chance for small markets means no real American soccer community. I think we've kind of touched on that one, but I think you'd probably agree with that. But I mean, what would you what would you say to Brian that you haven't said to me? Brian, I, I would say to Brian, I'd say to everyone else, if we're going to talk expansion, I'd have San Antonio on my list as opposed to other places that are being discussed. I think San Antonio creates a organic rivalry with that city. They've got a soccer specific stadium. They've shown they can support it. Then you got the rivalry with Dallas and Houston. Ted, San Antonio would be on my list. How many? But how, how many potential markets are there out there, and can they all fit into a, a D one? I, I think it's a very good question. I think soccer specific stadiums. Which, by the way, it drives me nuts. We call them soccer specific stadiums. Yet we've got football lines on the field, <laughs> but that's a different. Topic. But but it, to a certain point, I, I think there if they. There's a, if you have your own stadium and the capacity is over 10,000 with the option to expand, then I, thought, I think you have a legit, uh, a legit argument to saying you can fit into a D1 type of uh, environment. Here's another question. Uh, R1GS77, otherwise known as Rudy, asks, can a fold by DC United affect MLS? Or I would say Chivas USA. Uh, what, do you, what does he mean by that? I'm guessing, would there be a huge detrimental effect if DC United or, I would say, Chivas USA folds? Um, yeah, I do. I, I believe so. I think DC United's history and MLS being successful winning MLS Cups, do I think a new stadium is going to really help them? Yes, I do. Um, do I think there's? It's, a, it's interesting to see them keep a Ben Olsen after the type of season they've had, so all that's part of it, but I think... The, the fold from them, yeah, I don't think it's good. I think Chivas USA has to move, Ted. I'm sorry. And, and I, I've had great discussions with Alexi Lawless about this. He says there could easily be three, four teams in L.A. I totally agree with it. But if your name's Chivas USA and you're playing in StubHub Center, I don't think it works. I really don't. 
And honestly, I'd move Chivas USA to San Antonio. But that's me. Enough said. Um, here's a question from Steve Graff. Would you support a university, university-sponsored teams like the University of Maryland competing in the pro system? 100%. And what is mind-boggling to me, and I've said this in front of coaches in college, I've said it in front of the NCAA, and I've said it in front of the NSCAA. I have no, we have literally the perfect infrastructure for a minor league system. Mm. We literally have the perfect infrastructure for a minor league system in college. Yet for some reason, the NCAA says they can only play three months of competitive soccer. And any coach that tries to tell me, Ted, that the spring season is competitive? Come on. No, it's not. It's like saying friendlies are more ca- are just as competitive as World Cup qualifying games. Sorry, any, they're not. Any chance NCAA lets, lets college teams participate in U.S. Open Cup, you think? I don't know that, honestly. That's a really good question. I actually don't think that's a deal breaker if you had to ask me right now. But then... Imagine if you could play at University of Maryland, where I went for two semesters. Imagine if I could have played there for eight, nine months mm-hmm. instead of just three months, then taking a break. And then the off season, I go train with an MLS club, and that becomes your academy system to a certain extent. I remember, as a, Ted, I remember as a JV Ted, player on a D3 team, we weren't allowed to have official practices in the spring. It was absurd. Right. And, like, I, I just don't get that. And yet – Here's the absurdity of the whole thing. They'll allow college football and college basketball to basically be their feeder systems, and they'll change the rules to benefit those sports. Makes no sense to me. Uh, This is a question from Football and Community. Do you think NASL could create an environment that feeds the grassroots in U.S. soccer? Yes. Of course I do. Why not? Yeah. I mean, it's grassroots. It's It's at the lower levels. It's at maybe some environments, some cities that they're not on the MLS picture, but of course I do. How can you not? It's competitive. I see some. I watch some of the games. I watch some of the Cosmo games, the Silverback games, because obviously Eric Winalda just being a part makes you interested in it. And so I started watching those games. I, yeah, I, I'm naive if I say no. Do you think, and this is my question, do you think yes. Florida can support uh, Tampa Bay, uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Beckham's future team, and Orlando. Ted, I, I listen. I, I'm not on my soapbox, but I'm skeptical of, uh, of Florida, and, you, and I you always will be. You I mentioned mean, that today, and and I and I can't. I think one of those teams has to go, and it'd be a shame to see one of them go. Yeah, I just don't. I mean, Ted, LeBron James, D Wade, and Chris Bosh are in the <laughs> NBA Finals, and they don't sell out Game Six. I know. So we're gonna, you're gonna tell me, you're gonna tell me David Beckham, and in trying to find a soccer specific stadium down there, do you think the city's gonna allow that after what happened to the Marlins? Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. I don't know. And I actually, with what's going on in Austin, Texas, I almost kind of wish Orlando City kind of stayed there, to be honest. But, but. I will eat crow, and I've said this on Twitter. If Orlando City proves me wrong, fair enough. I'll be the first one to admit it. All right, this is Aaron Blue 91 Why do some small clubs not want promotion and relegation? Relegation would increase money and interest in lower leagues. Um, I don't know. Do we know that for a fact? That uh, well, they I've had this argument. Relegation? I mean, that's kind of a – throw that from you from behind. But that's – some of these lower division teams do say we're not ready to be promoted – um, you know, yeah. we don't have the finances in place. Uh, you know, promotion is would yep. be a would be a would be trouble for us. Uh, look what happened to some teams like the Cleveland Stars. They tried to do a promotion and 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 they folded because they couldn't meet the obligations. Now, and you so you answered it very well done, and that's exactly what it is. I think the promotion element of that scares a lot of owners because they're at that fine line of well these finances work but then once they get promoted i and and that ultimately is why promotion relegation will not work right now well now, I, would, there are I would argue that you're throwing teams. that in though i would argue that you're throwing that it's it's tough to, to do promotion relegation piecemeal and it's tough to, i think for teams to 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 realize the benefits of being promoted without opening it all the way to the top. So I think that some of those some of those okay. fears yep. are systems. I, I agree. Specific. I agree. Yep. Yep. I agree with that. That's a fair statement. 
How does Taylor Twelman rate Bob Kraft as an MLS owner? Kraft's desire to win. Thoughts on the Revs' endless uh, soccer-specific stadium search? And that's from uh, Rob McDougall. It's a great question. Um, I think I'll address the soccer-specific stadium one first. Uh, what a lot of people forget, Ted, and, and the intelligent ones don't, don't get me wrong, the ones that have done history, but Gillette Stadium was not, that was privately financed, okay? And at the time, that was the only privately financed stadium in the country, $325 million. The Crafts did that themselves, and they did all that. Now, I will argue with anyone that they've made that money back tenfold with the Super Bowls, Patriot Place, and all that. To ask the Crafts to go to the city of Boston and to go through the legalities of it, to put the money down that it will take to get a sporting park type place in downtown Boston, you're talking almost the same amount of money. Ted. That's a tough one, and you bring up a, a really huge good win. point. And I don't give the, I I did not know that 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 Foxborough was that they financed that out of their own pocket, and that's kudos to the Crafts for that. Here's a here's a great. Here's a, gr- here's a great story for you guys, for your listeners and for yourself. We opened up at the time, it was CMGI Field, and it's the Dallas Burn versus the New England Revolution, and, Ted, we're going through the rundown so they can get you ready, you know what I mean, for the Patriots and all that. So, whatever, I score a couple goals, my dad's in town, he comes on the field, security guards tackle him, all this stuff, because it's after September 11th. And Robert Kraft's on the field, and Robert's like, who is that? And I'm like, Robert, that's my dad. And he comes over, he introduces himself to my dad, and he says, how about this stadium? I paid for it for every cent of my money, <laughs> privately financed. First thing he said to my dad. And, and I joke about it because if I did the same thing, I probably would have said the same thing. If I privately financed a $325 million stadium where, if you remember two years before that, there was talk of the Patriots leaving to go to yeah. Connecticut, to stay in New England, to move to St. Louis, stay in Boston, go to downtown Boston. So there's a fun story for there, and that's ultimately how I found out and did some research. It was privately financed. Have you? Have, did you ever talk to, to Kraft about promotion and relegation? Oh, I've talked to I, I bring it up to anyone. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting topic. What's interesting is Robert Kraft and his family have done a wonderful job of doing building the Patriots, but what this goes back to my original statement. That's in football where the salary cap and the parity has driven that sport to an unbelievable level, yeah. an oblivion, a billion-dollar business, Ted. So when you try to have conversations with these guys about the sport, you know, and, and they'll say, well, look at Real Madrid and Barcelona. They're in debt. Look at the debt they're in. I don't know how to argue that. Yeah. I mean, the system obviously I works. Know. The system, I'm sorry, I don't know. The system obviously works for these guys. It's a system they're accustomed to, no doubt. Uh, do you think these guys can ever draw lines between soccer and the NFL like like maybe you and I do? Yes. Okay. Yep, I do. I do because I think there's they're, they're very smart, successful businessmen, and until they start seeing the proper numbers they want to see in the books, I think they're going to go this way. But I, I, don't, I don't doubt – that at some point they would look at it and say, well, wait a minute, we've turned the corner, or that is. But that kind of goes back to you and I talking the chicken before the egg type crap right. again, which, Ted, I, this is why you you are very strong opinions, and you, you do a podcast, and we all talk about it, because what comes first? I don't know. Do you raise the salary cap with no TV ratings? Does that bring the TV ratings? I don't know. But to go back to McDougal's question, I think Robert Kraft, and unfortunately, we never won an MLS Cup, mainly because they didn't show up in big games, but that's a different story. If the Crafts and the New England Revolution, let's say we won two of the four MLS Cups, they can almost say to everyone in MLS, we did it without paying a designated player, staying under the salary cap. Isn't that funny? And without a, public, and and without a publicly financed way, stadium. <laughs> Yes, and that's the same way they would have they said it about the Patriots. I mean, in 2005, we went into MLS Cup, and he compared the Patriots to the Revolution. They had Tom Brady, we had whatever, and he said, he literally said that. And he said, we've got, we do it within the system, we do it within the cap, that's what we do with the Revs, that's what we do with the Patriots. Unfortunately, for the Revs fans, 
I didn't get the job done along with my teammates. We didn't win. But it is ironic, though, Ted, because imagine, let's say we won three or four. Yeah. They'd be the blueprint of what succeeds, quote-unquote, in MLS. Well, Taylor, that's probably as good a place to stop as any. Thanks for uh, being on the show again, and uh, thanks for putting up with all the drops and all the other uh, production conflicts we had with uh, the... Oh, it's awesome. Ted, the good part of this whole thing is that for the listeners at home, they have no idea what you're going right now for this podcast. Why didn't you go here and pick some social damage? Well, I'll tell you all the words up here, they did. You're insane.